I'll give you a little background on my firm. Uh, it was founded in 1971. Uh, we're one of the largest non-Big Four CPA firms in the, in the Mid-South area, which is, encompasses Arkansas, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Uh, we have approximately 60 people. We have eight partners, 36 CPAs, and a lot of other support folks that help as well. And our breakdown is roughly 55% audit and assurance and 45% tax and, and compliance. Uh, the industries that we work in are the nonprofit sector, the governmental sector, we do manufacturing, construction, healthcare, and then what we consider family owned businesses or uh, private sector uh, clients. So um, we are, uh, as far as our audit and test section, our department goes, uh, we have designated the governmental sector as one of our major niche areas of our firm. Uh, we work with basically every local government, municipality, uh, county government in the Memphis metropolitan market right there. So we do pretty much 90% of all the governmental work in our area. Um, so we have a broad range of clients in that sector. Training. We spend a whole lot of time training our people and training ourselves. Uh, matter of fact, yesterday I had to leave early for an in-house seminar that we put on for our clients. Uh, we bring all of our clients in, we bring in a speaker, and we do a governmental update for our folks so that our governmental clients are getting some CPE out of it, gives us a chance to interact with them in a non-work setting. Um, it allows us to discuss a whole host of various topics that are affecting the governmental industries. Uh, personally, um, I became a member in 2009 of our firm, basically a partner. Uh, I serve on a lot of not-for-profit boards. I head up our audit division uh, and head up our governmental audit section as well. Uh, probably the bigger thing that I do right now is the governor appointed me last year to the State Board of Accountancy, which is charged with more or less protecting the public from CPAs who are not knowledgeable and should, probably shouldn't be practicing. So we handle a lot of the um, the disciplinary issues within our profession. If you're familiar with the State Society of CPAs, you probably have obviously the Florida State Society of CPAs. That is an advocacy group for CPAs, representing them across the state. State boards of accountancy, which y'all have one here as well, are strictly to protect the public from people who probably shouldn't be practicing accounting. So that's a big part of what I'm doing now. All right, well, let's move on into the, to the fraud. To get into the whole aspect of what internal audit can do for, for your, your local government, your, your county government, whatever you're designated to be, uh, I will tell you this, that we have to talk about fraud, and fraud is prevalent. As a matter of fact, it's what I would consider an epidemic. So kind of my, my little tagline here is if we were doctors, we'd be talking about something like diabetes. And so when you think about diabetes, there are things you can do to manage your diabetes condition. Um, and that's kind of what we're gonna to discuss today. So uh, think about it in those terms. I want y'all to be really more focused on not the fact that we're talking about accounting and not accounting terms. Uh, a lot of what we'll talk about is what I would consider to be common sense things. So. Fraud has become a multi-trillion dollar problem in the world economy. And uh, this stat's a little bit outdated. I think they just came out with the 2012 reports of the nations. Uh, but the median loss caused by fraud cases was about 160,000. So that's a big number. Uh, some governments, it may not be as big of a number, but it's still significant. Uh, nearly a quarter of all those cases involve losses of at least a million dollars. So if you look around this room, if you had a fraud, everybody in here had a fraud, one in four of you would have been taken for at least a million dollars or more. Um, the median loss specifically related to the government public administration category was 81,000. So again, that may be a small number, but if you figure that one in four is basically a million or more, that's a pretty significant hit. So very, very important that we address the issues. So what does this mean? Um, we have a, a loss of actual money. I mean, money went out the door. Uh, we've got a loss of taxpayer goodwill at a time when probably your public is the most skeptical of government administration and uh, it directly diminishes the ability of our elected officials to govern. So do we have any elected officials in here today? So I mean just a quick poll, how many of y'all think any press is good press just out of curiosity? I know a lot of politicians that 
just either way, it doesn't matter. But uh, I will tell you, this is one piece of press that you probably would not ever want, um, especially if you're in a position of oversight over the finances of the local government, because uh, the public will hold you directly responsible for the loss of their taxpayer dollars. I mean, I think we all pretty well know that and probably have seen it in some cases. Um, so how do we combat this? The best way you can combat this, combat this is with a strong set of internal controls. Internal controls. You do not have to be a bean counter to understand internal controls. We're not going to talk about accounting principles. We're not going to talk about different mathematical calculations. What we're going to do is, is talk more about common sense items. Um, and what I want you to be thinking about when you think about internal controls is if this was my personal money or information, how would I deal with that? How would I protect that information or that money? So uh, think about it in those terms. I think if you can approach it from that perspective, that'll give you much more insight into how you need to combat these issues. How do we get started? How do we improve, the in, or improve an existing internal control structure that we already have in place? And I'm going to tell you, fortunately, we have a framework provided to us by the Committee on Sponsoring Organizations, which is the COSO. Um, who is COSO? Uh, COSO is a voluntary private sector organization that's dedicated to providing leadership to executive managed governments entities on control aspects. Where it's a whole lot of stuff to say right there. But what it is really is it's a group of, of organizations that came together in 1985 to basically examine the things that were going on with companies at that time and develop a framework to try to address the problems that were facing all organizations. Um, and so in 1992, they issued the four volume report entitled Internal Control Integrated Framework. And we're gonna talk about that framework today. Um, so hopefully y'all get a copy of these slides. Do y'all have copies of this in your stuff? I'm not sure, okay. Um, Key concepts within the framework. Internal control is a process. It is a means to an end, not an end in itself. Uh, internal control is affected by people. It's not merely policy, manual, and forms, but people at every level of an organization. It's a people issue. Internal control can be expected to provide only reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance to entities management support. So basically what we're saying here is that if somebody wants to write a check to themselves and walk out the door, you can't necessarily stop that. But what you can do is catch it timely and you can deal with it timely before that person does it over an extended period of time, before that person does it to a, you know, a much more larger degree the next time they do it. Um, so from that standpoint, just now recognize the fact that you can't necessarily stop somebody from taking something or doing something, but you can deal with it quickly and effectively. Um, Internal control is geared to achievement of objectives in one or more separate but overlapping categories. Um, defined as a, I'm sorry, definition of internal control and framework objective defined as a process affected by an entity's board of directors, management, and other personnel designated to provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of objectives in the following categories. So the effectives and effectiveness and efficiency of operations the reliability of the financial reporting, what you're putting out to the public, and compliance with applicable laws and regulations. Let's say you get grant money from the federal government. Are you complying with the terms of that grant agreement? What steps are being taken to ensure that you comply with those standards or those requirements of that grant agreement? The five components of the framework are as follows. The control environment, the risk assessment process, the control activities, information and communication, and monitoring. So these are the things we're going to be going over today. My colleagues will come up and talk about that in just a minute. Who is responsible for internal, internal control and why is this important? I don't know about the elected officials in this room if y'all actually are the ones that are hiring the auditors and signing the engagement letters and the rep letters, but I will say to you this, when these letters are signed and the representation letters are signed as part of the audit process, your organization accepts responsibility for the internal control structure. So you are acknowledging that when you sign these letters. Um, the responsibility rests within your organization. Um, 
Just real quick, I'm not sure how many of y'all know about Dixon, Illinois. Has anybody in here heard of Dixon, Illinois? Across anybody's radar? Basically what happened, this all came out in about April. It's a town in Illinois, obviously. Lady up there was the comptroller of the city. It is now up to, it started at about $30 million. It's now up to over $50 million that she has stolen from the city of Dixon, Illinois. Um, the reason this is significant is the annual budget of Dixon, Illinois is about $10 million. So you keep asking yourself, how does this happen? I will tell you this, there was an outside CPA firm that prepared the financial statements, and then they had a sole practitioner that actually audited the city. Make no mistakes about it, when somebody steals from an organization, it's never not a trusted employee. So think about that. It's not somebody you distrust or they wouldn't be in a position to have access to those things. It's somebody who you have implicitly given your trust to, uh, whether I say implicit, explicit or implicit. It's somebody that becomes easier to say, let's let somebody handle that because that's their territory, we'll, we'll deal with that. That's not my problem. They're the accountants, we'll deal with it. So if you're the elected official in this room, you answer to the public. And so when you go to get reelected and you go to do the campaigning process, the last thing you need to have is something like this hanging over your head. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Scott Lanigan from uh, LBA in Jacksonville to uh, go through the uh, process of uh, the COSO framework. For those of you that are not familiar with the LBA group, we were founded in 1966. We are by far the largest local firm in Northeast Florida. and We're larger than most of the big four firms. We have 85 total people in our firm and 12 partners. We serve pretty much the same industries that Trey's firm serves, but our specialty is not-for-profit and governmental organizations. I'm Scott Lanigan. In addition to being a certified public accountant, I'm a certified forensic accountant, a certified forensic consultant, a diplomate of the American Board of Forensic Accountants, and a certified fraud examiner. I serve as an expert witness and as a special master. As you might imagine, I get involved in a lot of fraud. Over the last quarter of the century, I've been involved in every type of fraud imaginable, so I'll throw in a couple war stories today. <clears throat> As Trey indicated, you'll want to make sure that your internal auditors are thoroughly familiar with all five components of internal control. I'm gonna talk about the first two, which is the control environment and risk assessment, and Barbara Fink will address the remaining three. Probably the most important component to internal control is the control environment. This is the foundation for all other components of internal control. It's the internal control culture of the organization. There are five principles related to the control environment. The first is that management and the elected officials demonstrate a commitment to integrity and ethical values. You want to make sure that your elected officials and senior management take this very seriously. How those at the top behave sends a message to everyone else in the organization. This is what's known as the tone at the top. In connection with this commitment to integrity and ethical values, you want to make sure that there is a mechanism for reporting abuse. You want to make sure that your staff can report abuse, whether it be a whistleblower program or an ethics hotline or just regular staff meetings, they've got to be able to report abuse. <clears throat> now I want to talk for a minute about whistleblower programs and ethics hotlines. I think they're very important. According to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, ethics hotlines are the number one deterrent to fraud. In addition, when you have an ethics hotline, your losses are going to be less than half of what they are at those organizations that do not have ethics hotlines. This is because your ethics hotlines allow you to catch the fraud much earlier and limit your losses. The second principle of the control environment is that those charged with governments must be independent from management. This means there can be no conflicts of interest. Any appearance of conflicts of interest will destroy all trust. The third principle of control environment requires that management establish structure and accountability. Management provides the first line of defense by establishing the structure and establishing the internal controls. The staff 
they provide the second line of defense by complying with the structure and complying with internal controls. Your internal auditors are the third line of defense. They perform audits, report their findings, and make recommendations. <clears throat> now I want to talk about making recommendations for a minute. I think that's very important. A lot of people think that your internal auditors are there just to find problems. That's not the case. They should be there to provide solutions as well. They should be making recommendations on how you can improve your organization. Having strong internal controls, as Trey indicated, is critical to preventing fraud. A recent study by KPMG showed that prior to the Great Recession in 2007, about one half of all frauds were attributed to weak internal controls. Four years later, in 2011, that was up to three-fourths. Last year, three-fourths of all frauds were attributed to weak internal controls. This is because of the recession. During the recession, everybody was forced to cut back. They let employees go. As a result, they had fewer employees performing more functions, and they lost control of the checks and balances. One important internal control I want to talk about is segregation of duties. What this means is that you do not want one employee performing a complete set of functions. If they do, they'll have the ability to commit the fraud and then to hide it as well. And I'll give you an example of this. <clears throat> I did an investigation into a million dollar embezzlement a few years ago at a not-for-profit organization. The comptroller wire transferred about a million dollars in 75 different wire transfers from the not-for-profit's bank account to his personal brokerage account. He also received the bank statements, he prepared the bank reconciliations, he maintained the books and records, and he prepared the bank statements and the uh, financial statements. Had there been adequate segregation of duties, he would never have been able to even, even execute the wire transfers, but there were not. So he was able to steal a million dollars and hide it. The only reason he was even caught was by pure luck. Somebody stumbled upon a bank statement. Had they not gotten lucky and stumbled upon that bank statement, he would have gotten away with it. Believe it or not, pure luck is one of the most prevalent forms that fraud is detected by. I want to point out that this organization was audited by a big four accounting firm every year. The big four accounting firm missed it. As a result of this embezzlement, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. The reason he was sentenced to 20 years in prison was because this was not his first embezzlement that he was convicted of. When the organization hired him, they never did a background check on him. Had they performed a background check, they would have determined that he was a convicted embezzler. In fact, the first $200,000 that he stole from his current organization was used to make restitution on his previous embezzlement that he was convicted of. <clears throat> I found it ironic that although they did not perform a background check on this controller who had control over the money, they performed a very detailed background check on me, the forensic accountant, before I could do the investigation. By the way, he plea bargained down to six years by agreeing to testify against a big four accounting firm. It was very embarrassing for them. They spent probably a million dollars in legal fees and had to settle for about a half a million dollars <clears throat> and a lot of embarrassment. The fourth principle of control environment is the principle of attracting, developing, and retaining competent individuals. This is pretty self-explanatory. You want to make sure your employees are competent. But this is very important for your internal audit function as well. I like to recommend that internal auditors be either certified public accountants or certified internal auditors. <clears throat> I also think they should be thoroughly trained in fraud. As, as Trey said, it's an epidemic. Frauds become a very serious matter. According to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, over 16% of all frauds occur at governmental agencies. And as Trey said, the average loss is $81,000. Fraudsters are getting more sophisticated. Our internal auditors need to keep up with them. I also recommend that internal auditors be certified fraud examiners. The Association of Certified Fraud Examiners is the world's largest anti-fraud organization. I highly recommend it. I'm actually going to their annual conference next week. The fifth principle of control environment relates to the accountability for internal controls. Accountability refers to the level of ownership that the staff are required to take. Again, this is going to be set by the tone at the top. How do elected officials behave and how senior managers behave? <clears throat>
<clears throat> that was the first component of internal control. I'm going to now get into the second component, which is risk assessment. Simply put, risk is the possibility that something will occur and that it will hurt the organization. Risk assessment is the process of identifying and analyzing risk and determine how you're going to manage your risks. The first attribute related to risk assessment is you have to look at your tolerance to risk. Depending on what you're looking at in your organization, your tolerance is going to vary tremendously. For example, if it's your external financial statements, you will have some tolerance for risk. You are going to accept some risk that there are some errors in your financial statements. Hopefully they're not that large, but there are going to be some errors. The cost of making sure that every number is exactly correct would simply be too high. Also keep in mind that a lot of numbers in your financial statements are going to be based on estimates. These can vary widely. I had a client whose actuary said their personal injury reserve should be between 150 and $250 million. In other words, if their financial statement said the reserve was $150 million, it would be correct. If it said it would be $250 million, that would also be correct. That's a $100 million swing. Although we have some tolerance for errors in the financial statements, there's going to be some areas where we have no tolerance. Areas that come to mind, corruption and illegal activity. Any incidents of corruption or illegal activity should be reported. The next control objective related to risk assessment is that the entity must identify and analyze risk. After risks have been identified, they should be analyzed. The first step is to determine the significance of the risk. The significance of the risk is determined by the likelihood of it occurring and the severity of its impact. A risk that does not have a like, high likelihood of occurring and won't really hurt the organization, you can simply ignore. Once you identify a risk, you have to decide how you're going to deal with it. You have three options on how to deal with the risk. The first is simply to ignore the risk. If you don't think it's really going to occur that often and the loss won't be significant, you can simply ignore the risk. Another option is to reduce the risk. You can do this by improving your internal controls or adding an additional level of review. Your third option is to transfer the risk. You do this by purchasing insurance. Before you decide what your response will be, keep in mind there is a cost-benefit relationship. If the cost to respond to the risk exceeds the potential loss, you probably shouldn't do it. The next component of fraud, the next component of risk assessment I want to talk about is fraud. This is an area where I spend a lot of time. Occupational fraud can be broken into three classifications. The first is fraudulent financial statements. This is the case where management intentionally falsifies the financial statements. They do this sometimes because they have unrealistic expectations and incentives to meet these unrealistic expectations. The second category is asset misappropriation. This is the most common form. The most common form of asset misappropriation is billing schemes. In your typical billing scheme, the fraudster sets up a shell company which bills the employer. The employee then approves the bill and his shell company is paid. That's the most common form of asset misappropriation. Another form of asset misappropriation is skimming. Skimming occurs when the employee takes the money without ever recording a transaction. I'll give you an example of that. In Jacksonville, a woman that was working at a parking garage of a large governmental agency was pocketing a large percentage of the parking receipts. It was detected by internal audit. The internal auditor did an analysis of how much money each employee was collecting during their shift. He noticed that she was collecting significantly less than everybody else. It was very embarrassing for her and her husband. She was uh, arrested, placed in handcuffs. She was on television and in the newspaper. Her husband was very embarrassed. He was a senior audit manager at a big four accounting firm where I worked at the time. The third type of fraud, which is often the most difficult to detect, is corruption. According to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, this is one of the most common forms of fraud in the United States. If you look at most other countries, corruption is the number one form of fraud. In Jacksonville, the chairman of a large governmental organization was recently convicted of 36 counts 
of corruption, including money laundering, bribery, illegal gratuities, and lying to the FBI. He was just sentenced to 40 months in prison. When you assess the risk of fraud, you look at the fraud triangle. There are three components to the fraud triangle. The first is opportunity. If you eliminate the opportunity to commit fraud, you will not have fraud. You can eliminate it sometimes by putting in internal controls. The second is the pressure to commit fraud. I am gonna talk a little bit more about this later when I talk about red flags, indicators that your employee may be a fraudster. Finally, you'll want to consider the rationalization of the fraudster. Keep in mind, most fraudsters don't think that what they're doing is wrong. They justify what they're doing. They tell themselves, I'm not really stealing the money, I'm just borrowing it, I'll pay it back later. Or else they tell themselves, I'm not really stealing it, I'm just taking what's rightfully mine. I'm underpaid, so I'm just paying myself for this. Typically, your fraudsters will start out by taking a few dollars at a time. Uh, the longer they get away with it, the more money they take. I did an investigation a few years ago where the fraudster started by taking a couple hundred dollars here and there. Three years later, he was taking ten to twenty thousand dollars at a time. The longer he got away with it, the more reckless he became. He thought he was invincible. He started writing checks to himself and signing them as an authorized signer. He also started using the organization's credit card for personal expenses. He used it for weekend getaways at the Ritz-Carlton. He used it for jewelry for his wife. The thing that really irritated the judge was that he had the audacity to use it at strip clubs. The final item I want to talk about with respect to fraud is signs to look for that your employee may be a fraudster. These are red flags. The most obvious sign is employees that are living beyond their means. Fraudsters have big egos. They like to live in big houses, drive nice cars, wear expensive clothes. When you ask them how they're able to live so lavishly, they'll always have a plausible excuse. They'll tell you they're a trust fund baby. They'll tell you they won the lottery. They'll have some, some form of an excuse, but keep your eye out for employees that are living beyond their means. I did a fraud investigation at an organization last year. Uh, the CEO called me up. I had an initial meeting with him. When I was pulling out of the parking lot, I noticed a lot of Hondas and Toyotas, and I noticed a bright red Porsche 911. So I called the CEO to ask him if it was his. He said, no, it's Billy's an accountant. I asked him how much Billy an, account, an accountant made, and he said $38,000 a year. That is a red flag. That is something he should have been looking for. Somebody that makes $38,000 a year normally doesn't drive a $90,000 car. Another red flag to look for is employees that have financial problems. This has become a big problem in recent years, uh, primarily due to the recession. Families that were used to getting by with two incomes are now having to get by with one. It creates a lot of incentive to steal. Finally, the last red flag to look for, employees with addiction problems, particularly compulsive gamblers and drug addicts. They'll pretty much do anything in order to support their addiction. The final component that I want to talk about is change. Everything's changing. Society is changing. Our processes are changing. The regulatory environment is changing and our technology is changing. Our internal controls that might have been effective yesterday, they may not be effective today. We have to continuously look at internal controls. I just covered the first two components of control, of uh, internal control, which were control environment and risk assessment. I want to reiterate that you want to make sure your internal auditors are thoroughly familiar with these concepts. Barbara will now address the remaining three. My name is Barbara Fink, and I'm an audit manager with the LBA Group. I specialize in not-for-profit and governmental entities. And today, I'm going to talk about the last three components of internal control. Control activities is the third component in the COSO framework. Control activities is really the meat of your internal control system. These are the policies and procedures that you can help your organizations write to ensure that your internal control system is that, that which would cover fraud activities. Control activities are gonna vary greatly by each entity. So it would take probably all week to go through every possible control activity that you could implement in each 
entity would be different and there would be a lot of discussion about what you should implement. But I want to talk about the main goal. The main goal of a control activity is to ensure that your transactions are complete, accurate, and valid. The first principle speaks to this. The first principle is that you will select and develop control activities. This is your internal auditor's role. I saw that some of you are actually internal auditors for your county, so this is where you can help your county come up with the right policies and procedures. The ones that I would like to focus on today are again, segregation of duties. I know Scott mentioned it, but it is so important. We're gonna talk about it again. I wanna talk about proper spending of your funds and I want to also talk about proper recording of your receipts. First, under segregation of duties, in the Journal of Forensic and Investigative Accounting, back in January of 2011, they polled a group of internal auditors. And internal auditors themselves said that segregation of duties is the most important control, control activity to mitigate against fraud. Further, the COSO framework itself says that segregation of duties provides the best assurance against fraud. Although, as we've discussed, it's never absolute assurance. But in an organization with proper segregation of duties, collusion would have to exist for someone to commit fraud. So how do you implement this very important control activity? First, you wanna look at all of your accounting positions and actually write out their functions, write out their duties. Hopefully this is already set up in the HR manual, but if not, start from scratch and write out what everyone's doing. Then you wanna check for incompatible duties. Incompatible duties would be those of recording, authorizing and approving, and then handling the assets. So as Scott mentioned, you don't want someone in charge of the entire process. Once you have all that written out, then you need to discuss within your group whether or not you need to hire additional individuals or how you can reassign these incompatible duties. And that goes back to your risk analysis. Which ones of these risks are you willing to accept? Is it cost prohibitive to hire another individual or do you have the funds to hire another person? If you don't have the funds to hire another person, then you need to implement controls at a higher level that'll mitigate these lack of segregation of duties. For example, have someone in a higher position be reviewing the work of the person with incompatible duties. You also wanna make sure that all of your accounting staff is properly trained. If they don't know what duties they should be performing and what duties they shouldn't be performing, your controls are not going to be operating effectively, even if you have a great policy written. Let's move on to the proper spending of funds. As we've discussed, some of you are elected officials, but all of you are stewards of public money. And there's an expectation from your constituents that you are spending this money appropriately whether it be in compliance with certain granting agencies or just to the better of the society that you're promoting. What should you do in this area? First, you wanna designate one person for each compliance activity to make sure that they're champion that you're in compliance. They're the ones that need to be looking at your budget to actuals. They need to be looking at your profit and loss statements on an ongoing basis. Someone needs to be in charge of this process to make sure it stays important and current. Next, you wanna make sure that you have formal purchasing policies. And I know, again, this sounds like common sense. This sounds like easy stuff that hopefully you already have, but there are public organizations out there without that. In doing research for this speech, I came across the LA Coliseum. I don't know if any of you are familiar with them, but they are a lesson in what not to do. They didn't have a purchasing policy manual. And in their recent controller review of their accounts back in April of 2012, she found that a lack of policies led to over $300,000 in purchases on personal cards. It also led to $4.5 million janitorial contract that had no backups behind it. We don't know if it was a competitive bid or if it was someone's neighbor. Without having the controls in place, they can't say that there wasn't fraud occurring in this organization. The controller's investigation can only point out issues, and now there will be legal proceedings to determine whether or not it was actually fraudulent activities. Lastly, you wanna make sure that your segregated duties are apparent in your proper spending of funds. Let's go over exactly what this means. First of all, a person who can review, sign, or authorize checks 
should not be the person who can initiate the checks. The person who mails the checks should be separate from the person preparing the checks. The person who can go into your computer system and set up vendors should be separate from both of those so that they're not setting up fictitious vendors and then paying them. You also want to have someone higher up in management investigating any payment discrepancies. Vendors with a problem should call someone other than the AP clerk because if the AP clerk is the one who issued an invalid check, she'll make that complaint go away. Going back to our friends at the LA Coliseum, a lack of segregation in duties actually allowed them to spend $870,000 on an event in South America that never happened. Don't find yourself in the news for these kind of stories. Moving on to the proper recording of income, it's the same goal as the proper spending. You want to make sure that you're recording it appropriately so that you know how to spend it. You also want to make sure that you're charging the appropriate weights. As the clerk of courts, you're charging various fees for various people, so you need to make sure, first of all, that you have set rates for everything that you're charging. These rates, in a perfect world, would have been approved by your board of governors or by the elected official themselves. And then you need to go one step beyond that. You need to make sure that these rates are published. They need to be available to the constituents on your websites. Looked like everybody had very good websites or in a brochure, or even just as simple as when they're coming into the clerks to pay, it could be behind the wall, the rates that they need to be paying for these. Believe it or not, we can go back to our friends at the LA Coliseum. They didn't have any published rates. So when they put on an event, no one knew what they were supposed to be paying. So there were instances where people didn't pay anything at all. There are instances where for the same event, different groups paid different things or on recurring events, as the events grew from a few people to thousands of people, they paid the same fee. So again, the LA Coliseum can't defend themselves against fraud accusations of conflict of interest, corruption, or bribery. So what specific duties in this area should you make sure that you segregate to prevent yourself from becoming in a news story? The person who's collecting your accounts receivable should be separate from the person who is opening and mailing your checks, or receiving your checks, excuse me. The person who's depositing the cash receipts should be separate from the person who's then posting them to the accounts receivable. And then you want to have a separate person doing the bank reconciliations, making sure that the cash that came in is getting deposited into the banks. And same thing as on your accounting payable side. You want to make sure that there's someone different who the customer complaints go to so that that's a red flag for them, that this person says that they're paying, why are your receivable clerks still calling them and asking for money? One global control activity that you can apply to talk about both proper spending of funds and proper recording of receipts, and to help with segregation of duties if you don't have enough employees, is the management review of your budgets. On an ongoing basis, management should be looking at your budget to actuals for any strange fluctuations. They should also be looking at your other reports, your financial statements, and your statement of activities to see if they have any unusual fluctuations. Like I said, there's a lot on these. Um, the second principle is that you need to select and develop controls over technology. Our world has become more and more dependent on technology. And the internal control systems of even a decade ago are not relevant to recording this information. Back to the Journal of Forensic and Investigative article, those internal auditors polled found that technology areas are your biggest risk. They felt that this is the area where fraud is most likely to occur and the damages are most likely to be the largest. From the PwC 2012 State of the Internal article, Auditor article, they noted that 69% of stakeholders just who filled out the survey said that they believe that the internal auditor needs to focus on the area of technology. This is where they see the highest risk to the entity and where the internal auditor can be the most beneficial. Talking about your electronic data, you want to make sure that it's complete, accurate, available, and well protected. The goals for protecting that that you want to look at for IT control activities include access controls, proper IT planning, proper change management planning, and even a disaster recovery plan. 
This is one area where it doesn't even matter just what your employees are doing. You can set up perfect internal control activities for your employees, but this is an area that is highly susceptible to external threats. Hackers are out there trying to get into the information and then do illegal activities. For example, just recently, the Utah IT department head had to step down after hackers were able to get 780,000 Medicaid recipient data information. This hacker walked away with social security numbers, birth dates, and other personal information. It's pretty hard to recover from that kind of security breach. You also wanna make sure that you're protecting both your physical and electronic data. A fire department in Idaho just recently realized that people will steal both. An employee of, who had a disgruntle against payroll corruption came in and stole the electronic files and the physical files before the county could go through their audit or any other investigated fraud accounting. This fire department doesn't even know what they lost because they didn't have the controls in place to protect it or to keep a record of it. And I know that you guys are in charge of a lot of personal data, so you want to make sure that you have plans in place to protect it. Secondly, you want to make sure that you have controls over your change management. You can set up great functions and you can have the appropriate policies written, but if you allow anyone to go in there and change your system, they may negate any controls that you've put in place. So you want to make sure that changes to your software or applications are both approved and done by approved individuals. So how do you protect all this without being an IT expert yourself? Some of it's pretty simple. You want to make sure that you have complete passwords. You want to make sure that they're complex. They're not your name or one, two, three, four. They have special characters and other um, things in them as well. You also want to make sure that your system has a password lockout policy so that if someone is entering the wrong password, the system will shut down and they will not be allowed access. You also want to make sure that you have firewalls in place and that they're up to date, that your antivirus software is both present and current. And you want to pay particular attention to your Wi-Fi access. Believe it or not, an unsecured Wi-Fi area is a great way for someone to come in through that and then access your server, which you think is protected. Lastly, you want to make sure that you've got procedures in place for disaster recovery. It's not exactly a fraud topic, but as we've seen, Mother Nature can rear her ugly head, and you want to make sure that you've got processes and procedures to protect the data from storms or any other natural occurrences. Just like control activities, there we could spend an entire day talking about this. So I want to lead you to the Internal Institute of the Institute of Internal Audit has a global technology guide on there that's available if you're a member. And if you're not a member, you can still see a lot of it, which outlines ways to control your IT areas. Principle number 12 is just saying that you want to deploy your control activities through policies and procedures. They don't necessarily have to be written, depending on the size of your organization, a one day training may be enough. But again, it's generally better to put them in writing and that way the people following you know what they're supposed to be doing as well. So that was a very quick overview of control activities for your accounting and your IT. And as you take back this COSO framework and you think about it, you want to make sure that you have control activities that will help with verifications, reconciliations, authorizations and approvals, controls over your physical data and your standing data, and any applicable supervisory controls. The next component of the COSO framework is information and communication. This component supports the other four. It's how you manage and report your data. It consists of both internal and external communication. The first principle under information and communication is that you're using relevant data. Here, it's often a, a case of more data doesn't mean better data. So you need to step back and look at what data is critical. You want to make sure that your data is timely, sufficient, current, correct, accessible, protected, verifiable, and retained. 
One simple area that you could go back and tackle right away is, is your chart of accounts where it needs to be? Your chart of accounts for accounting is your fundamental source of data. If the right information isn't there, then you can't produce the reports that you need to for your monitoring function, or the internal auditor can't come in and test during the monitoring. So you wanna make sure that your chart of account has enough data to show how assets are restricted, how revenue is restricted, it would be able to functionalize your expenses so that you can go in there and see if anything looks out of whack. You want to make sure that you're tracking your expenses for compliance and for segregation. And then other things you might want to look for is if you're doing any lobbying or supporting any lobbying. That's something you might want to specifically identify in your chart of accounts. Management is responsible for ensuring that each of your organizations, if you have different branches, are using this consistent data chart of accounts and that data can flow through everyone consistently. The information communication principle number 14 is that you're communicating internally. Effective internal communication allows for an employee to communicate up, down, and across the organization. You need an open door policy. Your employees need to be able to talk to someone and your management needs to be able to ask your employees, the people on the front line actually doing the activities. And as Scott mentioned, this is where you would find your whistleblower. You want to have the whistleblower hotline, as he said, it's a very good way to mitigate fraud risk. You want to make sure your employees know where it is and that your public knows where it is, knows what happens to a tip that they call in, and more importantly, knows what happens to the person who actually makes the tip. Principle number 15 indicates that you want to communicate externally. Looking at all the different websites for the Florida Clerk of Courts, you have a lot of people that you report information to. You report to the Auditor General, you report to the State Legislator, you report across organizations and up the organizations. So you wanna make sure that you have policies in place that you're communicating the right data and that your data is correct and verified before it goes out the door. You also wanna make sure that you have the proper controls in place for people communicating externally to you. Where does the information go? Is there a number that they can call? Is there one point of contact or do they go all the way to the elected official? The last component of the COSO framework is monitoring. Monitoring is very clearly where internal auditors fit into this whole concept of the framework. Monitoring is separate from just a control activity of review in that monitoring happens on an ongoing or a separate basis of testing. Control activity review, however, relates to one transaction. Reviewing the accounting, reviewing the check, that's a control activity. Going in and testing a set of transactions or management reviewing a budget on a monthly basis is a monitoring activity. Principle number 16 suggests that your monitoring should be ongoing and separate evaluations. Management. Those of you in the management role are responsible for this ongoing evaluations. Your internal control system is always moving. Your transactions are always occurring. So your review and your monitoring need to be continuous and always occurring. Review budget to actuals, review your profit and loss statements, review analyticals year over year. The separate evaluations is where your internal auditor comes in. The internal auditor can come in and select a sample of transactions. They can set up analytical procedures like Scott had indicated. And they can do it on a quarterly, a monthly, a yearly basis, whatever you feel like you need to get started. As Scott indicated, you wanna make sure that your internal auditor is effective for this separate evaluation of monitoring. They need to understand fraud. They need to understand the process that they're auditing. You wanna make sure that you could redo this process before you go in there and audit it. You also want to make sure that you identify what you would consider to be an exception before you start testing. This is important because as you go in there and you find what might be an exception, you don't want to allow the person who committed the exception to talk you out of what it was. So you want to have a clear definition going in that you say, if I find this, that's an exception. And speaking to that, you also want to go in with a professional skepticism. Although you're the internal auditor and you're working for this organization, you need to go in as almost a third party. You need to forget that these are your coworkers and go in and 
Not assume that everyone is doing wrong, but as Trey said, sometimes it's your most trusted individuals. So just make sure they're following the policies and procedures that you've put into play. The Journal of Forensic and Investigative Accounting gives us some ideas of testing to help mitigate fraud risk. For financial statement fraud, some of the best tests that an internal auditor can perform are cutoff tests of revenues and expenses, tracing and reconciling, actually picking transactions and retesting these procedures, then just step back and look at their internal control procedures for the group that you're about to audit. Do they make sense? Are they even appropriate? Before you test to see if they're operating effectively. And third, create analytical procedures. Review expenses year over year. Go back to your parking lot attendants and see if they're all creating the same revenue on a given day. So start with transactions, look at your internal control procedures, and then look at analytics. To look for fraud and misappropriation of assets, the article suggests Again, to perform cutoff and reconciliation testing, but then to also do a general ledger scan. Pull a scan of transactions happening near or after period end. That's typically where you can find inconsistencies. Also, scan the entire cash account. Just scan it. Just look for any unusual activity. And lastly, under misappropriation of assets, which speaks directly to what Scott found, look at wire transfers. With the advent of technology, these are a very easy way for someone to quickly steal money. And with how quickly they are, they can steal many times before going undetected. Next, it spoke to IT controls and where you should look for testing in that. They suggest basically a detailed review of the internal controls over IT. Next, they suggest penetration testing and vulnerability scans. Most likely you're going to want to hire a third party who specializes in these type of scans to come in and they can tell you where your network's vulnerable and provide suggestions on how to fix it. Throughout all these tests, you need to keep your professional skepticism and you need to incorporate an element of surprise. If the person perpetrating the fraud knows that you're going to come in the third Monday of every week, you're going to look at all transactions over 10,000 and then you're going to leave you better believe they're going to commit fraud on Tuesday and they're going to do it in the amount of 9999 So when you do your tests, you want to change your scope, change your frequency, and just try to add a little bit of an element of surprise. The last principle under monitoring is that you evaluate and communicate deficiencies. So you've defined your deficiencies, you've done your testing, and you've actually found some exceptions. What do you do with those? Well, first, as a team, you need to evaluate what these deficiencies mean. Are they systematic? Was it a simple one-time occurrence? And how do you need to communicate these? The standards for professional practice of internal audit require that you commit it to the person who hired you. So you need to commit it, you need to discuss it with your board, and you need to discuss it with the management. The standards also say that you need to discuss it with anyone that you are legally or statutorily required to. From a cursory review of the statute, it doesn't specifically say, but some reviewing of some of your policies, these become public record. That's how I find out about the LA Coliseum. That's how the press found out about the LA Coliseum. So your reports are becoming public records, so you want to make sure that you have identified the deficiencies, what caused it, and offer any possible solutions, as Scott had indicated. Overall, we've covered the entire framework. And as Trey said, this is always changing. Internal controls are an organic system. Your company is an organic system. So you want to make sure that you're always reevaluating your internal control using the COSO framework. That brings me to the conclusion of my session. Thank you.